we're moving to an energy system where tens of millions of actions and assets will be on this system. If what we do is continue to do it how we've done it in the past, somewhat analog, um, actually the system is going to fall over. So data and digitalization isn't sort of a nice to have, it's absolutely essential to manage the complexities that we're seeing on the system, even today, never mind by 2030, 2035. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. My name is Dan Monzani. I'm the Managing Director for UK and Ireland at Aurora Energy Research. And today on the podcast, I'm delighted to welcome Laura Sands. Laura's had a diverse career in energy and consumer rights, including spells at the Consumer Association and working on open democracy and civic rights in Eastern Europe. Today, she's a non-executive director at SGN and also at the Energy System Catapult. Laura has recently chaired two government task forces, one on energy data, and recently published uh, last month, in fact, the Energy Digitalization Task Force. Laura, welcome to the podcast. Lovely to be with you, Dan. Lovely to have you. Um, Before we start, um, we're going to spend most of the podcast, I think, talking about data and digitalization. Um, But before we start, how have your perspectives on managing the energy transition changed uh, through the different phases of your careers, uh, through working on consumer rights, through your time as an MP, in fact, uh, from 2010 to 2015, and to your uh, non-executive career now? Well, Dan, I suppose it is a journey like everyone else has been on. I mean, um, I've always been involved in consumer rights and worked for which for for a while. And in many ways, um, I, I think that being an MP for, I was the MP for Margate and Ramsgate, and the average wage there was £16,500 a year when I was uh, the Member of Parliament. And I think that brings you real sort of stark realisation about both consumer rights, um, energy prices, and the the experience I had um, in talking to constituents was one of the really toxic issues around energy prices was it was probably one of the only bills that um, the customer didn't know what was inside the envelope. And it's the volatility, and may I say we're seeing so much of that today, that was really the, I would say, almost frightening element of the energy bill. So I see everything to do with energy through two prisms. One is those people who are on very low incomes. And the second point, which is as important, a different perspective, and that is us combating climate change. So how do we square that circle? I I believe we can, I really do, but we have to consider both those elements together. And so that might be the the journey that I've come on, um, having left now politics and almost uh, become a human being, um, I'm uh, sort of hoping to, to help make change with others. Brilliant. Well, that, that sets us up perfectly to talk about uh, a couple of areas you've had a major impact on over the last couple of years, uh, working, I think, with a number of people at the energy system, catapults, and of course, widely across the industry, which is data and digitalization. Um, I want to start just by asking you what good would look like, or perhaps what brilliant would look like. What, what would a world-class digital energy system look like? Well, firstly, I just want to say um, a huge sort of congratulations to the Catapult who've really been, you know, spearheading this initiative. Um, What does good look like? Well, to be frank, Dan, I think one of the things that we are probably quite bad at in the energy sector is actually learning from other sectors. And if you look at um, how data and digitalization has absolutely transformed the food system, absolutely transformed how we consume data. So I'm on this computer, I don't know where the data is coming from. And really, to be frank, I don't really buy the data 
what I do is I, I buy subscription packages, etc. And all of this is done in food, data, and in so many other parts, I mean, Amazon, all of this is done in a, through data and digitalization in a totally autonomous way. So the consumer has very, very little friction. And when we go forward and look at the energy system, we are going to have to optimize both the demand side and from my consumption will have to be optimized as will the offshore wind farm. And how do we do that? So what is going to look good is that we have a system where we can optimize, i.e. reduce prices, um, absolutely bear down on infrastructure and utilize it to its furthest extent. And all of this in seamless and fair packages delivered to consumers. So I, I think we just have to consider this new world. And the new world is currently we have probably 400 people who run the energy sector and not meant to be too derogatory, but they probably all know each other's golf handicap. We're moving to an energy system where hundreds of, certainly tens of millions of actions and assets will be on this system. If what we do is continue to do it, how we've done it in the past, somewhat analog, um, actually the system is going to fall over. So data and digitalization isn't sort of a nice to have. It's absolutely essential to manage the complexities that we're seeing on the system, even today, never mind by 2030, 2035. So much of what's got to happen to make a net zero system by 2035 feels like an, a radical step change in quite a short period of time. Is, is that the way we should think about the challenge for data and digitalization? Is it, is it a revolution or, or is it something we can handle incrementally over the next period of time? I mean, we should be able to handle it um, in, not incrementally, but we should be able to handle it because in many ways, data and digitalization and the so-called end-to-end um, -end digitalization of the system that's required happens in other sectors. Um, the issue for us is I think that um, the sector hasn't really been at the forefront, certainly hasn't been at the forefront of um, data analytics, um, digital management, um, mainly because it hasn't had to. So what we've got is we've, we've got lots of examples out there in other sectors. What we've got to do is to, in some ways, ad adopt those approaches. We've got quite a lot of cultural barriers. Um, and that is, you know, engineers really want to know that something is absolutely robust. They test it to destruction. It's got a long lead time and or a long um sort of asset life, digital people are totally iterative and very, very agile, and they don't necessarily know what the end destination is. And so we've got a bit of a culture clash, but I'm, I've seen over the last two years, I think we've seen quite a, a, a step change in appreciation that data and digitalization is going to be important. Um, I think we need to get on with it, because otherwise we're going to have an unstable system um, and we're going to have consumers who are going to have very, very clunky experiences. Just turning to the, um, the data recommendations you made a, a couple of years ago now, what, what were the main recommendations you, you made there and, and you talked about needing to get on with it? How, how much progress has been made since that report? Well, I have to say, um, thanks to you when you were at Bayes <laughs> and also to Ofgem, um, when we published, it was about six weeks that when after which the um, with Bayes and, and Ofgem accepted the recommendations, what has happened is our, our core recommendation was that energy system data, and that's not consumer data, but system data was presumed open. And this was a fundamentally important point because that data in many ways is, is ours. We as customers have paid for it, but is absolutely crucial to managing the system going forward. And it was quite a radical idea in, in the energy sector when we published it. In, in some instances, we were quite surprised to get away with that. But anyway, um, it's certainly <laughs> the right answer. Um, and really 
sort of thrilled that Ofgem have incorporated it into um, the network's Rio2 um, license requirements. And I think that everybody is on a journey, but the networks are, are, are really stepping up. We could, of course, go much faster and we should absolutely monitor progress. Um, but I think there is appetite I still though think there is this a, a bit of a sort of culture clash between those running digital within the networks and the so-called senior management who can't quite visualize what the benefits are. Right. So it looks like it sort of looks more like a risk um, than, than an opportunity in, in some senses. You no, know, it's just more of an investment rather than mm -hmm. an opportunity. Yeah. And yeah. the optimization of their assets could be really enhanced but maybe some networks haven't quite got there. Others are doing really, really well and moving moving really fast. And so there are some great examples. You talk actually, um, just to jump away from data for a second to your digitalization report, you talk about digital leaders. Is this an area where that would make a difference within networks, governments, regulators, to sort of shift those cultural barriers? Yes, and I mean, you know, um, your former colleagues, so may, maybe Bayes should have a um, senior um, data officer looking at data right across the whole of the portfolio of Bayes. Um, I think Ofgem have really leaned into actually the whole digital um, sort, of, sort of landscape and have got some really excellent people. Um, we do need, in some ways, some of the sector to move away from unthinking that digital is a sort of IT issue <laughs> rather than a business transformation issue. And, and that's really where it sits. So currently, in some companies, um, digital will sit within the team that rolls out Microsoft Office <laughs> rather than in the uh, business transformation team. And, and, and that's, this is all a journey. And, and so it's not criticism, but it is an observation. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, the, the other really interesting recommendation in the data report that uh, I think you build on in the digitalization report is around asset visibility, actually being able to, and this might do some shock people outside the energy system, I suspect, but that it isn't actually visible even to the system operator where every asset on the system is. Um, so the visibility of those assets, but also the development of that into a, a digital twin of the whole electricity system. Could you just explain yeah. a bit what's, what's meant by that and what benefits consumers would get from investing in a digital twin? So if one thinks about, um, for example, um, the number of EV cars that will be on the system by 2030, um, there are calculations that that equates to about two or three nuclear power stations. I mean, that's the sort of level of assets that we will have. But of course, they are micro assets and they need aggregation and they need to be um, utilized to support system stability, not to um, counter or, or, or threaten it. With our visibility of both sort of micro assets what I would call midi size assets, which I think we remember a couple of years ago when there was a system failure, actually there was some, you know, not huge, but reasonable size assets um, on the distribution network that, that nobody knew was there. And those are the things that if we're going to optimize the system, we need visibility of all assets and we need to utilize those assets to the benefit of the system. So without that base, that basic visibility, um, we are going to have problems going forward. I mean, digital twins are one sort of solution to, 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 um, to the challenge. In some ways, our big recommendation is to create this digital spine from which you can make your own digital twin, but we need to create interoperability. And, and maybe the best analogy to look at here is um, a little bit like the internet, the HTML of energy. Very, very thin, um, very limited, but total interoperability between an EV car and an offshore wind farm. Not that they're going to communicate, but that that interoperability can be accessed by those people who are optimizing the system. 
Um, so that would be our so-called digital infrastructure, like the plumbing. And then fab people can come in and do digital twins on top, um, optimize the system, come up with sort of whizzy customer propositions, um, assist offshore wind farms to understand demand so that they're getting better prices, looking at the blending of, let's say, renewables, hydrogen storage, um, and, and customers' demand. It, it just creates that plumbing. Otherwise, we're going to have um, a system that will be digitalized, but all in silos. And I call it the yeah. Tower of Babel, we will end up. <laughs> And is that digital spine? I mean, I, I completely see the the argument for interoperability and, and not having everybody designing their own plug and their own socket. Um, does that need to be uh, a set of common standards and rules and protocols, or does it need to be a, well, a, a maybe perhaps not a physical thing, but some some sort of common uh, enterprise architecture at the centre of the system? Well, I mean, one of the things we were very disciplined, Dan, I promise you, to only propose the very thinnest and the most limited um, central assets, right? And this asset would be very, very thin. Yes, it would be an asset in the sense it would um, triage data, but it would not um, compromise and it would not be an enterprise in that sense. Um, an enterprise would seem to have um, potentially revenues or be in some ways a centralized architect owning it. Because how we would perceive this is it would be developed in this very thin layer. It would then be given to the sector. So whether that be in a future um, system operator, whether it be off gem, and it would be also managed through um, open source. So open source, not meaning anybody can access it, but open source in the sense of software development. And so we see this as a very um, limited, but absolutely crucial, as you rightly say, it's a three point plug or it's the, the water system. And that then serves everybody and allows them to create great commercial opportunities on top. Are there good examples of uh, benefits we can see today from projects who are using shared digital infrastructure with that kind of open source software? Well, I would say that if you look at, um, so it's sort of interesting maybe um, analogy is Netflix. So what you do is um, you decide you want to watch one of the top 10 of Netflix, right? So where they have, they have optimized their system from the generation of the content, they've got, um, they've bought storage in lots of data centers. And then they also have what you might call local data storages. So their top 10 that you might be excited about actually is sitting in a local data storage because it's close then to the consumer. If you go off their top 10 and you go and choose something which is, you know, 20 years old, it will be coming from a central data center. And so what Netflix will have done is to optimize your choices by editing them in a sort of way, then designing the production of their content and the storage of it. And so it'd be exactly the same with energy. So you would have a lot, a lot more energy closer to consumers at, at peak points, and it would move back into the system um, at lower points in, in the day. And so that is all done through digital, a common digital architecture. And if you look at mobile and data, they all use a sort of common platform. And that's how they've been able to optimize it across lots of different partners. So BT, for example, is in some ways the base uh, communications line and people then add onto it. Right. So there's, there's, as you said at the beginning, there's all sorts of lessons we can learn from, from other sectors. I think perhaps not the digital spine, but certainly the digital twin that we talked about uh, a little bit before uh, have been, has been implemented in other countries. I think Australia have got a, yes. um, a version of that. Are there, are there lessons that we ought to learn from around the world? Uh, what they've done well, what's, what was good 10 years ago but needs to be improved upon? So we were talking absolutely in the first report and in the second report about this um, 
digital twin digital map, which would is dynamic and can show you exactly where networks are and where assets sit and and what they're doing in in, in a just in time situation. So Australia is great at that. Um, what we have, um, what's been really interesting is some of the problems in um, Texas and in California has, I mean, they're now starting to digitalize in quite a serious way, mainly because as we all know, when there's a crisis, people actually leapfrog and, and really think, you know, outside their old incremental thinking. Um, there is some interesting um, visualizations in France in the gas network. Mm. Uh, there's also Singapore is probably, I, I mean, you know, it's a great example, but it's also not necessarily a comparable um, environment. But Singapore has got a very deeply digitalized system and has really embraced um, data flows and um, sort of digital twin technology. I suppose that might be more of an example when we get down to those, um, as you say, those business plans for um, distribution networks and some of them cover exactly. large large city areas that would be, would be more comparable, I guess. But, but Dan, for example, there's something interesting about the food sector. So if you go into a supermarket and you take your semi-skimmed milk and you put it across the barcode, that will be telling, I mean, not that the cow is listening, but that will be telling the cow in a field that there needs to be more milk. Right? That is how digital the food sector is. And the chief executive of any big, uh, one of our big retailers could, if they really wanted to, is to find out where that piece of cheese or that semi-skimmed milk is in the whole supply chain. So it could, could identify that particular half pint um, on the M5 in a traffic jam. This is technology that's been around for years in the food sector. So in many ways, we should be looking at other sectors and saying they, they've gone on this journey. They have hmm. optimized. Now, there are lots of problems in the food sector. So it's, it's you know, there are other issues there, but certainly their digital um, management is, is, is phenomenal. That's fascinating. We, we've, we've moved a bit between um, data and digitalization reports, partly because actually you developed a lot of your points on open data and, um, and the digital spine across the two reports. What are the what are the main recommendations in that second report that we haven't talked about yet? If we are to have, um, let's say, these tens of millions of different actions and assets and that our system is going to be managed um, probably much more by demand than supply, and on the basis that weather doesn't take price signals or follow regulation, um, we absolutely have to unlock those demand assets. And we all know, and everyone you know, was worried about the big brother of smart meters. We absolutely have to unlock those consumer assets and reward consumers for their actions. But to do that, we have got to build trust. And to be frank at this moment, um, I would say that consumer trust and energy is not exactly um, hot. Um, so our very first recommendation is that there is a clear and common consumer consent dashboard. So my assets get automatically registered onto the system and then pops up for me is a consent um, sort of you know, window which says, I consent or I don't. We've got to give customers control to build that trust to allow us to un un unlock that value. So that is a crucial part of, um, of the architecture. The um, ease of auto registering your assets. So currently I think it's three to five places you have to register if you have an EV car. Well, that's not going to happen. I mean, it isn't happening. So we propose that, let's say, an EV car or a heat pump just has a QR code and that is automatically uploaded into an asset register. All of these things need consumer trust, and that's why we've got to put control there. Other elements of our um, approach is around cybersecurity, which is incredibly important. And we've learned a lot from the aviation sector. 
Um, they are obviously at the front line of, of really difficult, um, yeah. difficult issues. And actually it sort of reverses the way we look at security and cyber um, in the energy sector. And then um, we also feel quite strongly that these assets, these common and very thin assets do need to be delivered in quite a timely way, i.e. let's not hang around. And so we're proposing to Bayes that um, a digital delivery body is established, time limited, so only three years, but to deliver some of these core assets that then can be given into the system and then the delivery body stops. So this isn't establishing some sort of big organization, but it is about having very clear focus on getting these things up and running. It's a really interesting point about the sort of dealing with the risks in a sense and, and trust is obviously so hard to build but so easy to to lose did you um i think you also gave some thoughts on the, the ongoing governance of this is this something you see off gem doing more of or that you need a sort of specialist regulator to keep an eye on this um the, the digital governance of, of energy well i mean obviously at the moment it, it would sit with with off gem and i i actually think and, and maybe i'm overstating this that some of our recommendations however, could be useful for other infrastructures too. Right. Um, I don't know how it will emerge into the future. I do know that Ofgem absolutely have the capability to, um, to, to cover off the digital governance. I think what will be interesting is what digitalization of the consumer space will look like and how that will require quite a lot of change with how Ofgem looks at retail, looks at... Um, the approaches of how digitalization will change that consumer experience. But I certainly feel they're up for it. That's, I, actually, that's a really interesting area to dig into. What, what, one of the areas where the benefits for consumers are potentially really tangible is, is around the potential flexibility of domestic demand. But you talked about it a minute ago from a system point of view about yeah. that, that may be our main source of flexibility if, uh, if a, lot of the, um, a lot of the generation is inflexible. Um, but to do that, uh, we need to make sure the price signals are right, something you've called prices to devices, which I think is quite a nice, uh, a nice phrase. Um, I also want to just dig into a bit whether or not that is sufficient to drive the change that um, you want to see. We did a piece of work for our subscribers recently on the value of flexibility for householders. Um, it, it's really clear there's value to the system. In fact, you know, it's really hard to see, as you said, how you get to net zero without it. Um, it's also really clear that there's a huge benefit to the um, households that go smart in a dumb world um, but as that system gets smarter and smarter the, the obviously the, the arbitrage and the, and the benefits diminish a little bit so there's sort of there's still a benefit to being smart in a smart world but it's it's smaller I mean have you given do, do you think the prices alone if you get the granularity right will drive people to change or, or or should government be going further with regulation to require homes to be smart well, we, we certainly propose in the digitalization task force that all assets, um, all large assets in a home should be mandated to be smart, right? That doesn't, so I think there is an element there that, that can be put in place pretty quickly. I mean, I think your point is really, really interesting. I mean, firstly, I think we've probably got eight to 10 years of prices helping us manage the system. Maybe it's less, maybe not. Um, so I think prices can create incentives, not, not for me, the consumer, but for the person who's delivering me my energy services, right? So I'm not going to be watching, I mean, some train spotters might, but on the whole, I'm not going to be managing this. Somebody else will be managing it for me. So I think the prices can work in the interim, but your point is absolutely key is once we have fully optimize the system there is no price incentive because everything is flat i mean it'll never be totally flat but let's say it, it, it won't unlock investment then you need a different sort of regulatory model which is actually penalizing people for going out of flatness rather than incentivizing them and i think that that's a pivot point where we're going to have to really look at that but if, for example, we're in the world by then of services rather than commodities, 
actually a lot of these assets will be procured rather than um, looking at markets to determine prices. And that certainty, I go back to the families in Margate, really what they want is certainty. I mean, maybe this is um, sort of either naive or optimistic, but if looking at where we are today, if we could decouple those, um, the prices for fixed assets, i.e. wind farms and solar, which we've paid through contracts for difference anyway, um, from volatile gas markets, um, we might start to get a little bit more of an understanding of where the sector might end up. But I am no economist, so everybody can shoot me down at that one. Yeah, I mean, from our, from our analysis, it, 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 clearly more, more hours are set by um, zero marginal cost wins as you go out into the future. But actually, we see quite a persistence of commodity setting the price out for a while. Um, I mean, I, I wonder whether that's necessarily to contradict what you said, because, I mean, there are people already trying to develop energy as a service models and think about how you might, um, I don't know, lease uh, in-home assets like, um, like, like we've just been describing. Uh, that regulate people's energy use. Um, do you think that's a, a model that needs radical market reform? What, what are the main changes that would be needed to enable a, an energy as a service model to work? Technically, it can work today, but it is very, very clunky and very expensive for the um, for the provider because the license is all fixed around a commodity rather than a service. Um, and so there's quite a lot of resistance from, or, or there's a, just a lot of friction. So it's not happening and it's not happening at scale. I think it's absolutely crucial to start unlocking services rather than just commodities. So if let's look at the customer in six, seven, eight years time. We're expecting them to invest in capital assets, not in commodities. We're expecting them to invest in in an EV car, in a heat pump, or a, a change heating solution, or in energy efficiency. These are capital costs, they're not commodity costs. How can we unlock that? So let's look at the phone market. I mean, most people can't afford an iPhone outright, but what they can do is they can afford a package which actually embeds the energy, the, the, um, minutes and texts and, and data within that phone over a, let's say, a two year period. You start to look at those analogies and you start to say, okay, fine, we could amortize the cost of these capital assets that we require for decarbonization um, over a period of time, if what we are allowing is service contracts. So the service model works to unlock those assets the second thing that really does need reforming is we talk about the zero marginal cost of energy and potentially that increasing as a percentage of the energy we consume going forward. What's going up is system costs, right? Yes. So again, in data, in 1990, a terabyte of data was a million dollars. Today, it's five cents, okay? So if you think that it's potentially that we could go down that route, what is expensive in data is data centers. So what will be expensive in energy is going to be those fixed assets and that's all capital, which can be delivered on a service contract much more easily than a, a volatile commodity. So I think that we've really got to move to services we give predictability to the customer, risk sits with the provider, and yes, we've got to allow them to, to make money <laughs> because that's one of the other problems we've got is we've got such a fragile retail market, um, which doesn't really allow for retailers to invest in their customers. So it's a sort of perfect storm, as we all know. Yeah. You, um, yeah, actually, we, we, there's a link here to another report you published, I think, earlier, maybe last year, um, at Recosting Energy, which looks at some quite radical um, new approaches to retail, some of which you've just described. I was, um, was rereading one part of it uh, in preparing for this, and it really 
really um, right, maybe raise my eyebrows given what's going on in the markets at the moment. We talk, uh, there's a section on passing the buck where you talk about the, the consumer as the victim at the end of the line. Um, in other words, the risk is, uh, whether that's commodity price risk or, or, or imbalance risks, is passed through and smeared across the system, but it's not, it's not owned by any of the companies in, in the chain. Um, uh, and you, you had a rather prescient uh, observation in there that if, if it's not addressed soon, customers will soon be angry at rising costs, which I, I suspect may resonate today. Um, but equally, I think if I was a retailer listening to this, I'd be thinking, well, hang on, I can't bear that risk either. I've got really thin margins. I, I, d- I don't have a big balance sheet. Um, so wh- where do those risks of volatility sit in the energy system? Are they best with consumers or should government underwrite that in really extreme periods? Or does it need, do, you, do we need sort of, do we need to accept the costs of having buffers somewhere else in the system, whether it's retailers or somewhere else? Are there, are there any lessons from other sectors that you, you've seen where that risk's been better owned in the system and better managed? One of the principles of running a company is risk management. The point with the sector, everything is a pass-through cost. So actually risk, uh, I mean, risk management isn't something that the sector is used to. It just passes the cost from one to another, right? So I would say to you that um, absolutely margins are very, very tight. But the point is, if we ended up in a service contract, Mm. Uh, actually, you would start, first of all, companies could and should make higher margins, but not higher margins in how much energy they sell us. Actually, they would start to make higher margins the least amount of energy they sold us. So, for example, I take out a, 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 an iPhone contract and my I, I buy, um, you know, a certain threshold, a ceiling of, of data. Actually, my phone company is incentivized for me to use the least amount of data possible. So all the incentives are in the right place. Now, then every sort of two years, I will re-look at, I'll look again at my phone contract and I might bring it, bring my ceiling down because I actually, I've used less data. So I think that you can actually provide greater margins to retailers but not necessarily at a higher cost to the customer. Right, right. And our problem is, is that we're only looking at a commodity and it's the only way these guys make money is the more commodity that's utilized, not the least amount of commodity that's utilized. Fascinating. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating to draw the threads together um, across data and digitalization and into retail market design which shows the sort of growing linkages I think between between the different markets upstream and downstream um, here uh, look that's been fascinating and um, three really interesting reports as, as, as well um, normally what we do at the end of uh, one of these podcasts is a uh, quick uh, quick fire uh, section we call over or under and so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of concepts in the energy transition. And I'll ask you to say whether you think they're over or underrated in importance uh, for delivering net zero. And if you want to take a sentence or two to explain them, that, that, that's fine as well. Does that, does that work for you? Perfect. Right. Well, given everything we've just talked about in terms of digitalization and the, and the benefit to the system, my first one is um, investment in physical networks. Do you think that's over or underrated? I think it's um, overrated and underrated. So it's <laughs> overrated. It's overrated in the sense that the current predictions are far too high in the amount of investment that we need, but it's um, underrated in the sense that people are very binary. They say either it needs lots or it needs none. I think that we're going to have um, quite a lot of areas of constraint, which will need some investment, but we must absolutely optimize the system first before we start investing hugely because otherwise we'll kill digitalization and we'll kill optimization yeah uh, similar thing perhaps second question um system operator independence over or underrated um i think it's really really important i don't know whether that's overrated <laughs> that's true what, what, what is the um, consensus I, on that I one <laughs> I, I think it's absolutely crucial and I think it's exciting. Um, but I think what's also important is that it's shaped 
um, not to extend too far into the system. So I think it needs um, a very clear strategic role, but it would be uh, important to set its parameters. Brilliant. And um, last one, considering all you've said about in enabling markets, but also the need for digital spines. Um, do you think central planning is over or underrated? <laughs> I think it's both again. <laughs> I think there is the need for some very, very minimal and limited uh, common plumbing. Um, but it must be contested to be as thin and as restricted as possible to enable everyone to sit on top of it and be commercial and be dynamic and change systems. And so the digital spine is a little, as I say, HTML. I mean, it has very little functionality, but it is the three point plug. And so we need some interventions in all sorts of areas, not just digital, which is the three point plug. What you put at the end of that plug is absolutely should be at the very totally non-centralized and um, liberated to be commercial and interesting and exciting. Brilliant, thank you. Great, great answers. I, I, I agree with you. Actually, it's it, all of them have their place, don't they? Um, so uh, fascinating discussion, um, Laura. Thank you very much. It's been a really interesting conversation uh, across a number of different areas. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast today. It's been lovely being with you, Dan. Thanks so much. That was Dan Monzani, Managing Director for UK and Ireland at Aurora, talking to Laura Sandys, Non-Executive Director at SGN and the Energy Systems Catapult. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.